again, it's Cliff here from Down Under. Well, I've been meaning to do a video on probe accuracy, touch probe accuracy, comparing different design probes. And um, I want to keep it as brief as possible. And I could actually do about 10 videos on the series and it would be uh, pretty dry. So on this video, I want to cover the main subject affecting probe accuracy, and that is pre-travel variation. That's uh, I'll, I'll go into it in this video. It's a major factor in these low-cost touch probes, pre-travel variation. So I'll explain what that is and I'll demonstrate it a couple of different ways so that you can graphically see what pre-travel variation is. Okay, pre-travel and pre-travel variation. So you've got a probe and it contacts the work and it trips. Simple, right? And uh, it trips the moment the probe tip contacts the work. Well, it isn't quite that simple, unfortunately. What happens is you get pre-travel and pre-travel variation. And pre-travel variation is the problem one. Let's say that's your stem. They're all flexible to some degree. So, can you see that okay? So you've got your stem. So it comes into contact with the work, and the first thing that happens, it doesn't trip, it flexes the stem. I'm trying to get this really to show. So, you, so the first thing that happens is that you get stylus flex. Then you get the trip, the electrical break inside the probe. Now if you rotate the probe around to a different position, you'll get a different flex. You'll get a different pre-travel. Call it pre-travel variation. So in this different position, it will only bend a tiny amount and then it will trip. So that difference in flex between one rotary position and another is what we call pre-travel variation. And the more flexible your stylus assembly is, the more pre-travel variation you get. The more stiff your stylus assembly is, the less pre-travel variation you get for any given spring rate. Now obviously the high-end probes like the Renishaw and Blum and Heidenhain and so on have very sophisticated so, uh, calibration and compensation software which compensate for those errors so they still have pre-travel and pre-travel variation but it's carefully mapped and it's compensated for you have spindle orientation and you have uh, software which accounts for those pre-travel variations so uh, they get around it that way. But with a low-cost probe that doesn't have that compensation software, it's a really good idea to get the, the flex down to a minimum so that your pre-travel and pre-travel variation is at a minimum. Probably the easiest way to demonstrate and measure pre-travel and pre-travel variation is to put a dial indicator, a light finger indicator on the tip of the probe and jog it very slowly up against the face and when the probe tip contacts the face it will stop the traverse and you can measure, you can see on the dial indicator how much the pre-travel is. I'll just set up this camera on a tripod and you can see that in action. Okay, so we've got the impact tolerant touch probe set up with a dial indicator mounted on the head. And this is the procedure I suggest in the operator's manual that comes with the probe for owners of the probe to measure pre-travel and pre-travel variation. So you can see I'm just going to jog up against that face at a slow speed and when it contacts it, you'll see the actual amount of movement before trip. See there it is about one and a half hundredths of a millimeter. So I'll back off. Now we'll turn it to a different position. There it's about one and a quarter hundredths. Turn it to a different position. There it's about one and a quarter hundredths. There it's about it's hard to see without getting in front of the camera, but it looks like about just over two hundredths. So the idea is that each probe is slightly different and you probe up against the face in different rotary positions and you note down what is the pre-travel maximum and minimum and the mid-range 
the pre-travel variation midpoint um, is a distance that might be for example two hundredths of a millimeter so that is a, a radius dimension so you would reduce the diameter of the stylus tip so you measure the stylus tip with a micrometer instead of entering that in the tool table as tool number 99 the diameter for example of four millimeters you would reduce the diameter by two times the radius of the average pre-travel so it would be two times two hundredths or four hundredths less than four millimeters or 3.96 diameter and that would be the best setting for that particular probe um, they're all pretty similar um, but if you want to do high precision work it's best to measure your own probe in that way and set your pre-travel and that diameter is the effective diameter not the actual diameter of the stylus tip but the effective diameter Okay, now we'll measure Tormax SPU40. This is the first probe I ever bought and it got me started on this um, probe venture back in about 2015. Okay, so we've got it set concentric. We've got the dial indicator touching on the tip. We're going to slowly jog up against the face and see what the pre-travel is in that rotary position. It's 11 hundredths of a millimeter. That's quite a lot more because it has a slender, flexible, self-sacrificing stylus whereas the Hallmark ITTP has a stiff, solid stylus and uses retraction to avoid damaging the internals. Um, most of these probes use self-sacrificing stylus to avoid damaging the internals. So in that position we've got 11 hundredths and in another position, let's go back a bit to a different rotary position. There we've got about seven hundredths. And so you can trial different positions for your particular probe and find what the pre-travel variation is. Because it's not... Pre-travel in itself isn't a problem because you can enter an effective diameter in the tool table. It's the pre-travel variation that's the problem. So you need to find the midpoint. In this case, it's between about six hundredths and 0.11. Find the midpoint, which might be, what is that, 0 0.8, 0 0.085. So that's the radius amount. So take two times that off the actual diameter of the tip of the stylus and enter that in the tool table and you'll have the best possible setting but there's still a, a variation there that will, won't allow you to position as accurately as a probe with less stylus assembly flex. So on that first test where we jog very slowly up to a face we're measuring pre-travel and pre-travel variation that's both those errors Okay, let's run the probes on a CNC mill to actually show the pre-travel variation. So let's start with the Tormac SPU40, which is a typical, uh, fairly light, self-sacrificing, flexible stem stylus. And we've dialed it in concentric there. And what we're going to do is do a very simple probing routine in the Y we're going to probe and set the work origin and then we're going to find Y. Now it should be zero in theory because you've already set the work origin on that face and then when you reprobe it to find Y it should be zero. But um, we'll turn the uh, spindle to different rotary positions and you'll see the discrepancy coming up. Okay so we're all ready to conduct the test. Just to show that the stylus tip is concentric, I've got the dial indicator oh, in contact there. Hopefully you can see that alright. So the stylus tip is concentric. We'll set it in a particular rotary position. And we'll probe in, set, probe Y set work origin. Now if we find Y, we should get zero again. Well, it's two microns different. There we are, it's exactly zero. So now 
if we rotate the probe to a different position, say there, where we're going to get a different pre-travel amount, the tip is still in the same place because it's been dialed in concentric. But if now if I go Y, if there's no pre-travel variation, we should get zero again. Find Y. And we're getting 0.54 hundredths of a millimeter. So that's about two thou pre-travel variation. Okay, let's test the Hallmark ITTB. It's got a much stiffer uh, stylus assembly. It should have less pre-travel variation. We've got that dialed in concentric there. We'll probe Y set work origin here. And now we'll find Y. And we're getting it within a micron. Let's just do that again. Right, so we're within a thousandth of a millimeter. Let's turn it around now to a different position and find Y again. We're getting the same amount. Try a little further. Half a hundredth of a millimeter. Same again there. Let's go the other way. Six microns. Seven microns. Five microns. So the maximum we're getting is seven thousandths of a millimeter versus five hundredths of a millimeter with the more flexible stemmed probe. I've conducted this test and similar tests over the years and got slightly different results because there's lots of subtle variables here. Um, when the contacts actually break sufficient to trip the opti isolator in the main control board um, very slightly, um, you get different momentum issues with different feed rates, um, the dialed in concentricity of the tip affects it as well and so uh, if you were to repeat this test you probably get slightly different results, um, but you should expect to see a big difference between a flexible stem type of probe and a very stiff stem type of probe, such as this one. And on that second test, where we are using the PathPilot probing routines to jog up against a face, we are not measuring pre-travel, we're just measuring pre-travel variation. Pre-travel has already been removed from the equation by the selection of those two probing routines. So we're just measuring pre-travel variation. Now one thing I didn't mention was that um, you, some of you will be thinking, well, you know, pre-travel variation is a big deal. I, I think I can justify getting a really high-end probe. And you can spend, gosh, you can spend up to 20,000 US for a high-end Renishaw with all the calibration software and spindle orientation and um, compensation software. Um, and you can work to within one or two microns, one or two thousandths of a millimeter. But the problem is that these machines are actually not that accurate anyway, and it, horses for courses, there's all sorts of issues with these machines, minor problems to do with backlash, lost motion, stiction, friction, out of squareness of the head, gib adjustment, racking, thermal expansion. There's a whole list of things, errors in the TTS and the spindle, and um, they're all like quarter of a thou or half a thou each but they will typically not balance each other out and you'll end up with an error in this in your low cost CNC machine of anywhere between half a thou to two thou and if you dial it in really carefully you might get it down to half a thou so there's not really much point in having a high-end probe it needs to be something within the range that suits your machine and is justifiable from a price point of view. I mean a Hymer makes a lot of sense. It's not a high accuracy device either. There's problems with it as well. It doesn't have pre-travel variation but it has parallax errors and um, various uh, other areas errors to do with calibration and um, mechanical errors in how it returns to zero and you really can't work 
uh, any more accurately with a HIMAR than you can with, for example, the ITTP. Um, and you don't have the advantage of automatic probing routines. Well, those two quick tests show pre-travel and pre-travel variation. And if you're a bit short on time, um, that covers the guts of this uh, video on uh, probe accuracy. But um, so thanks for watching if you have to move on. Um, I'm going to go now more deeply into pre-travel variation and related subjects for those of you who are interested and have time. Um, I'll do some more tests and uh, dismantle a probe and show you some of the uh, theory behind what's going on here. Cheers. Some of you may have noticed I've been using a finger indicator uh, for getting these uh, distances and measurements. Um, and a finger indicator is not generally recommended for high precision, but it has advantages. It's very light in its pressure and for short distances it's quite accurate. Just show you here, I'll come into zero on the dial indicator and set the Y on zero. And uh, let's move at 0.1, which is the sort of range. And you can see there we're getting about we're getting a pretty accurate representation of 0.1. Um, and quite often I have to turn the dial indicator on an un unfortunate angle to try and get around the problems of uh, light reflecting off the face of the indicator. Uh, so you've got it twisted and you've got the little stylus on an angle and that's really not recommended to get accurate distances and measurements. But let's set that on zero. We're in a bad situation there. We're on an angle and we'll come in to zero there. We're a little bit out. 10% uh, out over that distance. But uh, it's not a massive amount on a short distance like that. It's, you know, remarkably good for what it is. But just keep in mind that when I'm making uh, measurements uh, and videoing it, it's more about getting the concept across to you, um, trying to avoid reflection in the lens, and I might not be able to see exactly what I'm doing. So there will be small errors in this video and other videos uh, when I'm making measurements. Okay, so for my next test, I'm going to set up the probes in the manual mill on the horizontal spindle and um, measure with these digital scales the forces, the different forces, to trip the probe stylus assembly in different directions. I'll zoom in on this uh, dismantled Tormac SPU40 here now, see if I can explain the concept of it. Okay, so you'll be familiar with this, some of you, that the, there's three arms at 120 degrees, and when the probe tip is in contact with the work, it breaks the circuit. One of those three pairs of switches or six contacts is broken. Now the problem is that you've got the force of the spring in the middle pressing down on it and the arms um, break away like that. Now you can see that the, the geometry of breaking the electrical contact is very different going in that direction than it is going in that direction. There's much less force to break the contacts in that direction than there is in that direction. And so that that is the genesis, that is the, the origin of pre-travel variation. And you might think, well, why, why do we have to have that design? Well, it's a very good design. A tri-swing arm, essentially three-point contact or uh, three pairs of balls, is very good to return the stylus assembly back into its central position. And this probe is not just about measuring uh, deflection, but it's also about returning back to its dialed in central position. Um, it's easy to forget that. And so the, the reason why this design is used on m virtually all of these probes is because it's very good to return back to zero. But you get this pre-travel variation problem. And when I say uh, you have flex of the stylus assembly, um, and sometimes I say of the stylus stem, it's not just the stem, a lot of the flex is in the stem. Some of it's in the hub, some of it's in the arms, 
And pre-travel isn't just generated by uh, Stylus Assembly Flex. That is the bulk of the reason why we get pre-travel variation. But there is other factors, minor factors, such as the variation in the braking, the electrical contact brake and how it trips the Opti isolator varies slightly. You get other little issues with different speeds and momentums and uh, quite a few little minor factors involved. Um, I'm just talking about the, the single biggest cause of pre-travel variation is stylus assembly flex due to that geometric problem of the different pivot points. So I've got it set up in the horizontal spindle here and I'm going to do three different tests. I've got a dial indicator touching on the tip of the probe and its probe's been dialed in concentric and uh, when it comes into contact it will show the amount of flex, the linear measurement of movement. I've got some scales which are going to measure force or pressure and I've got a little circuit which is a simple little 3 volt battery with an LED and a DIN socket which will measure when the internal circuit is broken. You know it's just a simple switch, um, a set of three pairs of switches or six different contacts if you like that are normally all closed and the LED is on and when the probe is tripped the LED goes off like that. So that's telling me the uh, trip point or the electrical situation. So I've got three different tests running at once. So I can do some interesting tests here to show pre-travel and pre-travel variation. Okay, I've got the camera on a tripod. Hopefully you can see the scales and the dial indicator, hundreds of a millimeter measurement and the LED. Okay, so we're going to bring the scales up in contact with the, dial, with the probe tip until it starts to flex. So what's happening now is the stylus assembly is starting to flex and it's showing the movement here on the dial indicator, hundreds of a millimeter. And we're also seeing the scales starting to register the pressure as it opposes the spring inside the probe. As we come up, 0 0.1, 0 0.11, and the LED goes out at about 170 six five grams something like that in that position we're getting about 0.11 of a millimeter stylus flex before trip and it's about 175 grams of force okay so i've rotated the probe to a different position now um, it's probably about 20 degrees rotated and hopefully you can still see the three measuring scales here. So we're in contact with the probe there. So started to flex the stylus assembly and we're going to go up until the LED goes out which is there at about 600. It's hard to see with the camera in the way but that's about 96 grams of pressure and about 600 of pre-travel. So you can see between those two different positions you're getting uh, six hundredths of stylus assembly flex in one direction and 0.11 in another direction, almost twice as much. And um, about, what did I say, about 90, about 95 grams in one direction and about 170, was it, in the other direction. So there's a big difference there. And that's down to the mechanical construction of the geometry inside the probe, the three arm swing arm problem. All these probes use that method because it's a very good way uh, for the probe to find its central position again after trigger. But it does have this problem that the three arms are at 120 degrees and when, when the probe is pressured from one angle versus another, you get a different amount of pre-travel. So we get pre-travel variation with a very flexible stylus assembly like this of between 600 and 0.11. That's a pre-travel variation of 500 of a millimeter or about 2 thou. So if you were to set the uh, 
effective diameter in your tool table of the middle of that range that would be uh, making it smaller down to a diameter of about trying to do the maths while I'm talking of about nine hundredths or something smaller in diameter than the actual measured diameter you'd be getting about the best compromise position and that would give you an error of plus or minus about a thou to a two and a half hundredths plus or minus a thou or two and a half hundredths pre-travel variation with a probe like this so obviously if you can get the stylus assembly to be less flexible the pre-travel is less and the pre-travel variation is less and you have you're more able to set the effective diameter uh, at the midpoint and you're going to get less flex and less pre-travel variation and you're going to get perhaps down to quarter of a thou or half a thou plus or minus which is a much better situation obviously you're tackling the fundamental cause of the problem here and not trying to address it with compensation software or a rotary spindle alignment uh, turning the spindle each time and so on better to get to the heart of the problem which is the uh, stylus assembly flex okay so we've got the hallmark impact tolerant touch probe set up now with a much stiffer stylus assembly um, i found the position one extreme let's just test that so we've got it returning the dial indicator hundredths of a millimeter oh it's not quite returning to zero but i'll take that into account so we're winding up there um, breakaway of the contacts is about there about three hundredths of a millimeter three hundredths of a millimeter pre-travel in that position if we take into account slightly off center zero to start with and that's about 140 grams something like that okay now i'll see if i can rotate it while oh, the camera's running to the other position i've marked which is the other extreme so i'll just write that down so we had 0.03 and about 140 grams and here we are getting okay so dial indicator is off a little bit i could fiddle around and try and reset that but see it's just getting a little bit of stand flex but it's okay we're half a hundred soft to start with let's just take that into account coming around now so now it's half a hundredth to two and a half so now we're getting about two hundredths of a millimeter pre-travel at about 93 grams 0 0.02 at 93 grams so you can see there the pre-travel variation is between naught three at 140 grams that's just over a thou and not two at 93 grams that's just under a thou so that's much less pre-travel variation than the flexible stem stylus where i was getting six hundredths and 110 grams and was it 11 hundredths at 180 grams so a fraction of the pre-travel and pre-travel variation and if you set the midpoint between the two in your effective diameter for your tool 99 you're going to get a tiny amount of plus or minus of a you know I won't do the maths in my head but you can work it out a much less amount of pre-travel variation there so thanks for watching guys um, I hope there's been something of interest for you in there um, I might do some more videos on accuracy if I get a chance cheers <laughs>